welcome to the universe. You belong. A poet on hearing Newton's law of universal gravitation wrote, to pick a flower disturbs the furthest star, which is true, because everything is connected. The flower to the star, the star to the flower, the raindrops to the green leaves, the green leaves to the raindrops, and you to everything, and everything to you. For you are alive and aware, here on this particular spaceship called Earth, in a particular time we call now. Just where and when are we, though, in the here and now? Let's take a trip to find out, an imaginary trip. Did you ever lie flat on your back and stare up at the sky? You can see a long way, a long, long way, like millions of miles and millions of years, years ago. As the clouds move off and the stars come out, you can see things that are not only millions of miles away, but things that happened millions of years ago. And only now is the message of light from these ancient happenings reaching you here on planet Earth. But wait, I said we look up. But where is up? To the people living on the bottom part of the globe, up would be down. To the people living on the right-hand side, up is to the right. To the left-hand side people, up is to the left. To the top side people, you get the point. In a spaceship, there is no up or down. There is only into and away from the spaceship itself. Now for us here on Spaceship Earth, we should say we are not looking up, but out. If we climb a tree, we are not climbing up, but away from Earth. Let's do it. Let's get into a small spaceship and move away from our large spaceship. If we do this, the first big thing we would come to as we move away from Earth would be the moon. Some of our fellow humans have already visited the moon and brought back samples of rocks that they found on its surface. Now let's move on to our sun, our nearest and closest star. And if we whip around that star we call sun, let's explore for other large objects. The first one we would find would be the planet Mercury, for Mercury is the planet closest to the sun. Moving further out and away from the sun, we would find another planet, Venus. From our Earth, Venus is the brightest object we can see in the night sky, except for the moon. Venus is about the same size as Earth, but not as comfortable. Dense clouds of sulfuric acid blanket its surface and swirl in giant storms in a hot carbon dioxide atmosphere. If you look at Venus through a small telescope here on Earth, you would see it in one of its phases. Phase means that to us here on Earth, only a small portion of the planet Venus is visible, that part that is facing the sun and thus reflecting the sun's light to us. After Venus, moving still further out and away from the sun, we come on to our own home planet, Earth, here seen in one of its phases. To someone on Mars, say, a small section of planet Earth would be facing the sun and thus reflecting the sun's light to them. And we keep moving. Mars comes next. For many years, people had high hopes of finding life on this planet, but so far, no luck. Viking 1 landed on the Mars surface in 1976. For many years after that, it sent back once a week reports on the surface temperature and pressure with weekly news photos. Well, the pictures have been dramatic, but they do not show any evidence of life. After Mars, it would be a while before we got to the next planet out from the sun, Jupiter. Meanwhile, between Mars and Jupiter, we would pass by many millions of small and large chunks of orbiting rocks. Astronomers call these mini planets asteroids. And some think that here, in this asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, we will find the most likely spots in our solar system for future space colonies. Why here? 
because these orbiting rocks contain almost all the elements needed to build future spaceships, space factories, maybe space resorts, space cities, even new space planets. Once past the asteroid belt, we would come to the great planet Jupiter, the largest planet in the solar system, with a mysterious red spot. Since Voyager 1 and 2 pass by, we also know that Jupiter has at least 14 moons, many of them with belching volcanoes. Next out would come Saturn, with its beautiful rings. We know now that there are over 100 of these rings, and 17 moons. The inner rings seem to be made of red ice. The recent pictures taken by Voyager 2 also show spokes in those rings, and we're not sure what causes the spokes. The next planet out from the sun is Uranus, which also has rings, at least nine of them. Uranus is even more mysterious than Saturn. One scientist recently speculated that its surface may be blanketed with tiny diamonds. After Uranus, we would find Neptune and Pluto. These last two planets in our solar system are so much further out that even through high-powered telescopes, they look like tiny dots. They look like stars. But we know they are planets, not stars. Like Earth, they do not send out their own light, but their glow comes from reflected starlight. In this case, sunlight from our own special star, our sun. All of these planets are near neighbors in space, as these things go. Though not all that near. At the speed of present-day spaceships, for instance, it would take us about nine years to make a round trip to Saturn, and over 40 years to go to Pluto and back. Suppose we did spend the time to go to Pluto and kept going, as Voyager 2 was already done. What would we find? Nothing. And more nothing and still more nothing. Oh, maybe a few atoms of hydrogen now and then, but pretty dull going. Despite these few hydrogen atoms, around us would be a better vacuum than any we have yet created on Earth. If we did keep going long enough, say about 150,000 years at present day spaceship speeds, Four and a half years, if we could go at the fastest possible speed in the universe, the speed of light. Eventually, we would come to something big, another star. Would that star have a solar system? Would it have planets like Mercury, Venus, Mars, Earth? Well, we don't know. There is a good chance. Some astronomers say about one chance in ten that the star would not only have planets, but that at least one of its planets might nurture life. Would that life be intelligent? We don't know. Maybe, maybe not. Of course, if there was no one home around the nearest star, we could hop in and keep going and try another. And we would have many choices, many chances, because there are many stars out there. So many stars and possible planets. Well, we need a good map to keep from getting lost. People in ancient times liked looking at the stars, and they imagined figures in the sky, arranged in what they called constellations. They invented wonderful stories about these figures in the constellations. There was Taurus the bull, Sagittarius the archer, Aquila the eagle, and Pegasus the winged horse. Well, we don't take seriously any more the stories, but we do use the names for our sky maps. Here we are looking, for instance, at a small region of the sky in the constellation of Cygnus, the swan. Here is a part of the constellation of Gemini, the twins. Here is a beautiful section of the Orion constellation seen through a large telescope. It's called the Horsehead Nebula. Actually, it's a huge mass of dark gas in the shape of a horse's head that blocks the light from the millions of stars on the other side. Here is another nebula. 
think of it now, every dot of light you see in this photograph is a star. And each star is as big or bigger than our own star, our sun, and maybe one in ten of those stars has planets. Here is a part of the Milky Way band in the constellation of Sagittarius. Billions of stars, each like our sun, burning brightly, sending out light and heat, radiant, life-nurturing energy to, to whom it may concern in this wide, deep universe, perhaps to some ancient landscape or waterscape on a planet billions of miles from us. Maybe, just maybe, enough like Earth to say hello. We don't know. It's fun to speculate, though, and it's fun to find out. Here on Kitt Peak in Arizona, for instance, is the largest assemblage of telescopes in the world. Here and at hundreds of other telescope sites around the world, astronomers study the heavens and take some of the photographs you have just seen. We are no longer restricted to the mountains of Earth for telescope sites. Here is the newest and most powerful of our tools for learning about the universe, the Hubble Space Telescope. Unfortunately, a serious flaw in its mirror was not discovered until after its launch. Despite that flaw, however, it is already sending back data about the universe unmatched by any Earth-based telescope and astronomers think they will be able soon to correct the mirror flaw and then we will be able to see out much further and much sharper than ever before. But let's get back to our imaginary trip. The universe is so vast we have barely begun. You see, so far we have been cruising through nebula and constellations finding billions of other stars like our Sun and perhaps billions of planets like our Earth. But all of these objects are a part of a much larger thing that astronomers call a galaxy. In this case, all a part of the Milky Way galaxy, our galaxy. We can't really get outside our Milky Way galaxy to see what it would look like from outside, but we think it would look something like this, a disk shape, with most of the stars concentrated toward the center. From another angle, it would probably look like this. We do know that our star, the Sun, is a medium-sized one out toward the edge of one of those pinwheel-like rays. If we could look from outside, we would also see this huge Milky Way galaxy slowly turn like a giant spinning top. I mean, consider for a moment how complicated and interesting this matter of moving can get. On Earth, we are spinning around on our axis every 24 hours. But Earth is also moving in a giant orbit around the Sun once every 365 and a quarter days. And with the Sun and the other planets, Earth is circling in the disk of the Milky Way galaxy. And as one small part of the Milky Way galaxy, Earth and all the other billions of stars in that galaxy are moving through dark space, through nothing, and still more nothing, and again and again more and more nothing. And if we moved in our imaginary trip, outside the Milky Way galaxy and kept going, this is what we would find for a very long time. Moving at the speed of light, we would have to keep going for over a million years before we would be rewarded by finding something. Another galaxy. This is the nearest galaxy to our Milky Way, the great galaxy in Andromeda. With the naked eye, you can just barely see this galaxy as a tiny, hazy spot. Through one of the large telescopes, it looks like this. Uh, then again, if we had the time, millions of years more would be needed. We could go on and we would find other galaxies. 
remember, too, that other great mystery, this huge galaxy, which has within it billions of stars, constellations, nebula, planets, and we know not what, is so far away from us that what we are seeing here is actually the way it was millions of years ago. And this is because it has taken the light we see here, fast as light moves, a few million years to get from there to here. So what we are seeing is not only the far away, but the long ago. Here is another galaxy, far away and long ago. Here in one telescopic view, we see not one, but five galaxies. Each galaxy millions of light years away, with only now the light reaching us to report on what happened millions of years ago. Here are still more galaxies, many more galaxies. This is a very small section of the night sky, showing in one view dozens of galaxies. Here's another view of the night sky. Each bright dot there is a galaxy of its own. Each galaxy with billions of stars making up what we see as a single dot. Billions of galaxies, each with billions of stars, each billions of miles apart and billions of years ago, and every second of every day of every year moving still further apart. The mind boggles. How many of these billions multiplied by billions have planets where right now someone is wondering if you exist? We may never know. Or we might. Robert Frost once wrote that poetry begins in delight and ends in wisdom. Many of us would make the same claim for science.